Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Look up, love. Take your eyes off the ground. Show your face. A new day is here. The light is rising over you, shining brightly, moving shadows, touching your face. You are brilliant with it. Darkness may come and go, but the glory of our Creator is a constant companion, a steady light. Many will see you struggle to live, your choice to stand up and walk in the light and be changed. Have the courage to truly see not only the problems, but the one who remains with you holding the light. We are all coming together, family, neighbor, and exiles, taking our seats at the table. We are learning. We are healing. So, take the gift of this day you are given. Let the light enlighten you, emanate from within you, become you, be you. Power is shifting, and it won't look like what we think when love reigns. Cities riddled with the wreckage of war and marked by the scars of empire will exchange the sounds of violence and ruin for the clamor of co-creation and communion. Through the power of God, the oppressed and those stripped of their land are allowed to share in power. We all will weigh in. Life will grow from the most unexpected places. The smallest and least will be welcomed into the center, and their perspective will matter. Not only will violence cease, we won't want to hurt one another, but cooperate for the goodness of all. 
The whole nature of creation will change. The sun and moon will not be the light we revolve around. We will turn and grow by the light of God that shows us the illumined way to go. We will be ruled by the power of love. We will be remade and refastened to God and one another. We will learn what harmony means. Look up, love. Take your eyes off the ground. Show your face. A new day is here. The light is rising over you, shining brightly. Moving shadows, touching your face. You are brilliant with it. Everything wrong side up is being upended. The table is extending, rounding. You have a place that is only yours. And everyone, everyone, everyone at this table will have more than enough. So, stand up, open up, take it all in, and shine. sister, God love you and God bless you. My brother, my sister, God love you and God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. May God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. God hold us all in 
those almighty hands of love. May God hold us all, those almighty hands of love. Good morning. I want to start by acknowledging what a crazy week it's been. Yet another crazy week. And that's affirmed in me, once again, our need for one another. Our need for perspective, our need for conversation, our need for community. And I want to offer you a couple of places to plug in with the Crosspoint community that offers just this. The first is winter groups. Winter groups are groups of adults that meet virtually for between four to eight weeks talk about specific topics, but also have a lot of great conversations. You can find out more about the offerings for winter groups at crosspoint.org slash winter groups. Second, next Thursday, January 14th, virtually at 7 p.m., we're gonna host a community conversation. Our theme is COVID, what we've gained, what we've lost. We're gonna come together and talk about just that. We're gonna look back at 2020, we're gonna look forward to 21, and we're gonna have some small group um, conversations, but we're also gonna listen to the Reverend Jessica Stokes from the North Carolina Council of Churches talk about how COVID um, is, a seri- is a, about trauma and grief, how COVID relates to all of that and some tools to moving us into 2021. You don't have to register for that event, but it would really help us to be able to plan if you would. You can find out more about that and you can register for that event at crosspoint.org slash conversations, or you can go to our website, crosspoint.org, and you'll see it on the main page. Lastly, as always, you can contribute with us financially to partner, to reach out into our community at crosspoint.org slash contribute. You'll find lots of ways um, to participate financially there. Bottom line, I love you, Crosspoint. So thankful to be in community with you, thankful for your perspective, thankful that we're able to come together um, and have these really important conversations. Thanks. Which way are you going? Which side will you be on? Will you stand and watch while All these seeds of hate are sown Will you stand with those who say Let his will be done With one hand on the Bible And one hand on the gun One hand on the Bible And one hand on the gun Which way are you looking? Is it hard to see? And do you say what's wrong for him? Is not wrong for me Well your light has changed Confusion reigns What have you become? All your olive branches turn to spears When your flowers turn to guns All your olive branches turn to spears When your flowers turn to guns Every day things are changing Words once honored turn to lies People wandering, but can you blame them? It's too far to run Too late to hide So now you turn your back on All the things you used to preach And now it's Let him live in freedom But only if he lives like me 
walk the streets of righteousness But you refuse to understand You say you love the baby But then you crucify the man And I don't understand I don't understand You say you love the baby But then you crucify the man So very grateful to you, Stephen Claybrook, and how you can take a song from the 1960s and make it sound like it was written yesterday and challenge us for the moment that we're in. So thank you. So Crosspoint, what a week, huh? Whew. I mean, what do you say? I don't, I don't really know. So what I've been wrestling with the back half of this week is how do we talk about what's going on in the world right now? And specifically what's happening in our nation, because there's a lot. And how do we talk about what's going on in us, in our own hearts, because there's a lot. And how do I not sit here in this moment and just keep recycling the same points that have already been made hundreds of times by all sorts of us that we've talked about, that we've posted about, that we've listened to all week long? And yet, how do I also be honest and transparent myself with where my own heart is at? Especially when we just started a teaching series called Heart Knower, for goodness sake while at the same time somehow trying to offer something to our community that doesn't just serve to throw more kerosene on the fire, but that will actually be helpful to us moving forward. So I'm not, not really sure, but I'm resolved to at least try. So last week, Steve shared this from the collection of wisdom writings known as Proverbs in the scriptures where a man named Solomon writes, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So in his quest for life's best wisdom, Solomon comes to the conclusion and insists that priority number one is to guard our hearts because absolutely everything flows from that. And when they thought about the heart then, as we tend to do now, we, we think about what's at our center, what's at our, our core, how do we feel, what's going on in our inner world. And right now, that seems especially complicated. And I imagine you feel this way too, because it's like our hearts are feeling so many different emotions at the same time that we don't really know how we actually feel. Well, thankfully, that same collection of wisdom writings in the scriptures tells us that's normal. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. That even in laughter, the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. I had these moments this last week when I felt so much joy sitting around with my family, playing some new games that we got over the holidays, and there are these moments when I just doubled over in laughter at times, sitting and playing with all of them. And then there were these moments where we experienced some really deep disappointment and grief as COVID outbreaks and restrictions put the brakes on another varsity sports season in our home. Not to mention the isolation and judgment you feel when your discernment is different than other friends and other loved ones' discernment. And yet at the same time, I found myself so incredibly grateful for our boys' resolve and their maturity and how they've navigated those 
disappointments over and over again. But then I got a phone call and found myself anxious and concerned, walking with some dear friends through some unexpected medical crises. And then I turned on the TV Wednesday afternoon and I sat there feeling scared and heartbroken and angry watching the live feed of all that was going on in DC. And so before long, I open my computer and I check in on social media and I start to feel glimmers of hope and encouragement watching people say, okay, enough is enough. And yet I keep scrolling and then I find myself dumbfounded and disappointed and confused and ticked off with more excuses and more deflection and conspiracy theories and all the whataboutisms. And then furthermore, there's this deep grief sitting like a cement block in my gut for what my African-American siblings must be feeling watching white rioters being calmly encouraged to walk out of the Capitol and back to their everyday lives. Yet as the night continued, I found myself thankful. Thankful that as broken and flawed as our system of government is right now, that some essential parts and values were still holding, shaking and rattling under the pressure like the Millennium Falcon trying to go through an asteroid belt, but somehow some of those core essential values were still holding. But then even later that night, I'm lying in bed and these wounds start resurfacing. Where for the last five years, we've tried to say that regardless of your policy and partisan leanings, regardless of how you vote, this type of rhetoric is dangerous. And it does and will cause real harm to actual people. And this is where this path, path is heading. And now I find myself lying there, not surprised, but with this ache throughout my entire body that I'm watching it happen in real time. But I found all those hurts bubbling back up again from all the wounds of loved ones who walked away without even a goodbye or who righteously declared that we should never speak about political issues, that somehow we've strayed from the gospel and they've called us names and they've questioned our character and our faith and remembered what it felt like when it felt like that they chose their defense of this president's toxic rhetoric, a man they knew only from television over their years long personal relationship with you. And then the next morning I find myself looking at my social media feed and surprised and shocked to see local and national leaders and friends and family members finally saying, no, this is unacceptable. This is wrong. This is dangerous. And my initial instinct is to be bitter and judgmental. Oh no, wait a second. You don't get to say that now. You've been complicit these last five years in enabling and encouraging this type of behavior with your silence and with your excuses. And you're a little too late to the party there, pal. But as soon as that feeling comes over me, I have to reface my own shame and regret and be humbled by the reality that there's been some parties that I've been pretty late to as well in the past. Like boldly advocating for the affirming equality and inclusiveness of all genders and sexual orientations in every aspect of our church. And yet I've been shown grace and was allowed to wake up and embrace a better way. And so why would I not give that same grace to others who are waking up now? And yet still, I felt proud of our board. I felt proud of our staff and our entire church that we didn't have to rush to put out some special statement this week and finally say something because all of you, you already knew exactly how we felt. This isn't new. And friends, this, this was just this week. <laughs> and all of those different feelings and emotions are still there. And I imagine it's similar for many of you. 
So when we're trying to figure out what's going on in our heart right now, which is it? Am I angry or am I grateful? Am I scared or am I hopeful? Am I encouraged or discouraged? Am I happy or am I sad? But the reality is this isn't an either or thing. That our hearts contain several different things all going on at once. There's an Old Testament scholar, Derek Kidner, who writes this, Our moods are not permanent and are seldom unmingled with their opposites. Many times, especially in moments like this, we'll have very different things going on in our hearts at the same time. Unmingled from one another. Because even in laughter, the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. So here's one thing I want to encourage all of you to do at some point in the next few days. I want to invite you to take some time and write down everything going on inside your heart that you're feeling today, that you were feeling this week, that you're anticipating feeling the rest of the day today and the next few days. Just take some time to do an inventory. How do you feel about what's going on in Washington? How do you feel about what's going on in the world? How are you feeling with stressful relational issues that you find yourself navigating with finances, with work, with your relationships, with how you feel about your body, the future, all those different things. Just take some time and do an emotional inventory. Now this isn't to turn in or to share with anybody else. There's no right or wrong answers here. Just write down everything that you're feeling. Now, as we prepare to do that later on sometime today or the next couple days, here's some important things that I want you to understand. Typically, you and I, we're not very good at this. <laughs> we're just not. Researcher Brene Brown says that over the last several years, she's received back over 15,000 emotion inventory surveys from people. And the average number of emotions that people can identify in themselves is three. Three. Now, before you roll your eyes at that or act surprised, it makes sense, right? I mean, after all, where do we consistently teach people about their heart from kindergarten to 12th grade? I mean, where do we teach them about their emotions and feelings and how to distinguish and process them? Where do we do that? And so as a result, the vast majority of people tend to identify three. The trifecta of glad, sad, mad, right? That we understand being happy, we understand being sad and we understand being angry or ticked off. And many times we live with the assumption that we're either one or the other pretty much all the time. But then we find ourselves in weeks like this past one. And we can easily get overwhelmed and exhausted because there's too many feelings and emotions going on in our heart. And frankly, we don't have any handles on how to deal with all of them. And then to make it worse, we feel this pressure to just pick one, to figure out what's the one thing I'm feeling right now when the reality is, again, even in laughter, the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. And so we're trying to solve a problem many times that isn't meant to be solved. There is no just picking one. We're carrying all of these at the same time. Time. And so, in the spirit of what Jesus says, everything boils down to learning to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I want to spend the rest of our time today trying to get a better handle on how to love ourselves better by paying attention to our own hearts, since everything in life flows out of that. And then in turn, how we learn to love others by better paying attention to their hearts. So, Here's some things that I want to encourage all of us to do. One, get in the habit of pausing and identifying. What am I feeling right now? Now, that may sound simple, but it's not something many of us ever practice. And it's probably the biggest obstacle to paying attention to our own heart. I mean, after all, how often when you hang up the phone with someone, do you pause for 15 seconds and think, okay, what am I feeling right now? 
or before you step into a meeting or engage in a conversation with someone else, how many times do you take a deep breath, check in with your heart and ask, okay, what am I feeling right now before I enter into this conversation? Now, you may hear that and think, you know what, I don't have time to do that. Uh, yeah, when am I going to have time to do that? Which then we need to kind of challenge ourselves with, really? Let's think about that. To check in with our heart from which everything in life flows out of. Or we hear that and think, especially as men, you know what? Yeah, That's, that sounds kind of soft. You know what you do? You just suck it up and you keep going. That's what you do. You don't stop and pay attention to feelings. And yet, when we find ourselves unable to have healthy relationships with the most important people in our lives, eventually I find myself sitting down with a lot of men who start to wake up to the reality that maybe that's not been a good strategy. And it often takes things completely falling apart and being destroyed before we're willing to learn a better way. So I'm telling you, it's worth it to get in the habit of pausing and identifying what am I feeling right now? Now, in my experience, we all need some help in identifying what we're feeling because again, the average person only identifies three. So take some time and Google this, this idea of a feelings wheel. Just type in feelings wheel and do it after the message and do it now for all I care, but type in feelings wheel, Google it and see what comes up. And you're gonna find something that probably looks like this. And it can start to give you language to help you identify what is actually going on in your heart. It gives you a vocabulary. One emotions researcher, Mark Brackett, stated in his research that out of tens of thousands of people who attended his presentations through the years, only three could even remotely identify the difference between disappointment and anger. That could specifically parse out, okay, what's the difference between anger and disappointment? That they had any, even, even so much of a remote understanding that disappointment has to do with unmet expectations and that anger usually has to do something with some perceived injustice. Yet understanding those type of distinctions is really helpful in discerning what's going on in our own heart. Because here's the thing, if we aren't moving toward a greater awareness of what's specifically happening in our own hearts, then what often ends up happening is we end up placing or projecting the most ignored and undealt with emotions inside of us onto other people. And so we have to learn to listen to our hearts and to pay attention to them, to get familiar with what's going on inside of us and being honest about that. And we need a vocabulary, frankly, that breaks us out of mad, sad, and glad. Because there's a whole world of feelings and emotions out there that we have to learn to pay attention to. Okay, here's another thing I want to encourage us to do. That when we ask others, how are you feeling? That we create space for an honest answer. Again, Mark Brackett in his book, Permission to Feel, he writes this. There's one of the great paradoxes of the human condition. We ask some variation of the question, how are you feeling, over and over, which would lead one to assume that we attach some importance to it, and yet we never expect or desire to prov for someone to provide an honest answer. Now, it can be humbling how true that is. Because the reality is, since we don't want to spend time on our own feelings, we really don't want to spend time dealing with other people's feelings either. So what we want most people to say is, you know what? Yeah, oh, I'm good. <laughs> I'm okay, yeah, I'm fine. And so then we can all move on. I mean, just think about it. Reality is if you're a parent and your kid wakes up five minutes before they're supposed to leave for school or start school on the computer, or you run into a coworker, maybe walking into the office five minutes before your meeting starts, or you jump on a Zoom call and you're there talking for a few minutes before it actually gets going and you say something like, hey, good morning. Hey, how are you doing today? What if someone said, you know what? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty hopeless today. Pretty disappointed. Sad. You know what? I'm just really angry. I'm upset. I'm feeling pretty anxious. Pretty overwhelmed. 
lost, confused. If they say that, what it means is you have to stop doing what you're doing and then offer your attention and support. And it sounds ridiculous, but many of us just don't feel like we have the time for that. They're just rushing around all the time. So we either don't bother even asking or we really put off the vibe that we really don't want an honest answer or the person we asked feels all of that pressure. They can sense that and tell that. And so because just the social norms of the way things are, they feel the pressure to just keep moving. And so that's what we all do. We all just keep moving. And we have to understand, if this has been the pattern we have with others for a while, it doesn't change quickly. It may take a good while for someone else, especially if it's someone you have some type of authority over, to start to trust the space that gets created and find it safe to be honest. If you've been going one direction for years, it may take a long time, years even, to turn that ship around. But if you want to love others well, not only do we have to fight to make our own hearts a priority, we have to fight to make others' hearts a priority too. So here's a third suggestion. Work on not assigning emotions to other people. Now, this is something that we can all find ourselves doing from time to time when we find ourselves asking people questions like, why are you so angry? Why are you so scared? Why, what's got you so stressed? Why are you so sad all the time? And you see, you might not even have ever thought about this, but what we do in those moments is what we're doing is we're assigning an emotion to someone. We essentially say, you know what? I'm going to tell you how you're feeling. And this happens in all types of relationships, but especially in, in family relationships and close relationships. And what happens is loved ones get stuck and they don't know how to answer or navigate the question because they haven't really tried to pause and identify their own actual feelings. And now that one particular feeling has been assigned to them, well, what's the point of trying to figure it out then? So it usually just sounds like, I don't know, I just, I just am. <laughs> but you see, instead of asking, why are you so angry? And questions like that where we assign emotions, if we can instead ask, hey, what's going on inside of you? And then create substantial and safe space for people to process. And then just let yourself listen. If we can do that, we'll gain far more insight into what's actually going on. Because again, this is how all these steps are tied together. When we take the time to better understand our own emotions and expand our understanding far beyond merely mad, glad, and sad, right? We start to understand that anger, again, usually centers around some kind of injustice and that disappointment centers around things that have to do with unmet expectations, that fear usually is about some type of impending danger and that shame centers around diminished worth in other people's eyes. And that anxiety has to do with uncertainty and that sadness is typically about loss. And so play this out. If you encounter a teenager who's yelling or slamming doors and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you so angry? What's got you so ticked off? When we do that, when we assign an emotion, we're missing really important intel. Rather, if you decide, okay, you know what? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit down next to them. I'm gonna put my phone away and I'm gonna commit to stay for a while and just ask, hey, what's, what's going on? What's going on in you? And create the space to listen. What we might discover over the course of time through whatever pieces of the story that may come out is, oh, we start to listen and go, oh, they had some expectations that were unmet. They were expecting you to celebrate them and instead you criticize them. And you discover, oh, okay, you're actually disappointed. That's what's going on. Or it comes out that they got rejected by someone and you start to realize, oh, okay, this isn't anger. This is dealing more with a sense of loss or a sense of shame. But each time, oftentimes it just looks like anger. It's yelling, it's slamming doors. And so no one feels loved, no one feels understood. 
Now, apply that same idea to what's happened this past week with how we've dealt with people we've watched on TV and how we've dealt with people on social media or in conversations with people that we're dumbfounded by. And we keep asking questions like, why are they so angry? Why are they so delusional? And we keep assigning these emotions and ideas and rarely do we find any of us taking the time to ask or even wonder, I wonder what's going on inside of them right now let alone what's actually going on inside of me. And then humbly just trying to listen because it can all just look like anger. And maybe some of it is, and rightly so, at some of the injustices that are happening. Absolutely, anger needs to show up when injustice is happening. But maybe what's actually going on in some is fear or shame, or disappointment, or anxiety. And if we genuinely try to listen to understand what's going on in someone else and pause long enough to pay attention to the reality of our own hearts, then maybe we respond better. Because here's what we all know to be true. We respond to people differently when we know they're scared versus when they're angry. We respond to people differently when we know that they feel uncertain versus when they feel neglected or unheard or versus when they feel sad. But we can't respond appropriately if we just keep assigning people emotions so quickly and we don't take the time to listen and to understand. Here's another quick suggestion. Pay attention to your body. Pay attention to your body. Again, in the wisdom writings of the scriptures, one writes, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. You see, even in the ancient wisdom of thousands of years ago, it was understood that what's happening in your heart is integrated in your physical body. And sometimes where we find ourselves is carrying around emotions or storing them or stuffing them and not giving them any outlet to be expressed. And eventually what starts to happen is those emotions start to show up in our physical bodies. And so in weeks like this last one, especially, you might find yourself exhausted and mentally and physically fatigued because of all the heavy emotions that you're storing. And if you do understand that's normal. But often what you'll find if you listen to your body is that if you pay attention, it will tell you. It will tell you when certain emotions have found, haven't found a way to express themselves. When they've just been stuffed for too long and they have to find a way to get out. They have to find a way to get out, whether that's us going to the gym or going on a walk or that means we have to get some extra sleep or that means you know, punching a punching bag in the garage or rolling down the windows on the car and turning the music up as loud as you can and letting some of that emotion out. Whatever you do, listen to your body and find a way to let your body express those emotions. Now, this is really important to hear, all right? To let your body express those emotions in a way that doesn't hurt someone, whether that someone is yourself or someone else. But if those feelings and emotions are stored up, eventually they're going to come out. They will in some way, shape, or form. So it's better to choose a healthy, non-destructive way for them to come out. Because when we don't, what they do is they come out oftentimes in destructive ways to both our physical bodies and out of our mouths and in our relationships. They're going to come out. So we have to learn to pay attention to our bodies. All right, two more ideas I want to encourage you with as we try to learn to better pay attention to our own hearts. Next, discipline yourself to ask the question, what do I want? Now, I've talked about this quite a bit before because this is something I've really struggled with myself. It's been a long journey of wrestling with this one. But this is the question that I've discovered that gets us as quickly as possible to how we actually are with our own hearts. One of the scripture writers puts it this way, each heart knows its own bitterness 
and no one else can share its joy. That each heart has to learn to pay attention to what it's uniquely going on in each of our hearts. And you see, each of us can either be true to our own hearts and to what's going on there, or we can try to avoid the reality of what's there and just pretend that it's not. And because of that, for some of us, that question, what do I want, is terrifying. Because the reality is we don't have a clue. It's so hard for us to ever try to answer that. Or even worse, it feels inappropriate to ask that question, what do I want? And for some of us then, it just immediately defaults to, oh, it doesn't matter what I want, right? It just matters what everyone else wants. Which is why this has to become a discipline where we ask, okay, wait a second, let me take a moment. What do I want? And as hard and as scary as that is for some of us, because we've lived so distant from the reality of our own hearts for so long, where we have no clue about our own hearts because we were taught to ignore them, what starts to bring us back to our own hearts is learning to wrestle with that question. What do I want? That it's okay to ask that question, that it's healthy and appropriate to ask that question, because again, how can we treat others the way that we want to be treated if we refuse to ever pay attention to how we want to be treated? So it's worth asking that question. It's good to ask that question. Okay, now, here's one more thing I'll leave you to wrestle with. What is it that keeps your heart alive? You know, one of the interesting things is, is that if you ask People, hey, what are some things that you do? What are some practices? What are some routines that you do that help keep your heart alive? Most people can come up with some pretty specific answers. But then when you ask them, okay, so when was the last time you did one of those things? What you often hear is something like, you know what, I, I don't really remember. I mean, it's been a long time, months, months ago for sure, maybe a couple years or something. I just, I can't really remember. And usually the excuse we come up with is, you know what, I'm just too busy. <laughs> I just haven't really been able to make time for it, I guess. And we find ourselves saying stuff like that as if, if keeping our hearts alive is some sort of luxury or indulgence something that we sort of tack on to our schedule if we can find a way to squeeze it in. And yet deep down we know, we know this wisdom from the scriptures is true, that everything we do flows from our heart. We know that. And obviously we have people that need us to care for them. And some of us have young kids. and We have people who get sick or who find themselves in crises and we have responsibilities and we have school and we have work and we have all these things, of course. But if we're going to guard our hearts, we have to know what keeps them alive and not treat it like it's some sort of indulgence. And sometimes that means simply being intentional about making some tweaks in our life and in our rhythm. And sometimes it means making some drastic changes. And it can be different for all of us, but it's worth making it a priority to keep our hearts alive because if we don't friends weeks like this past one can crush us weeks like this past one can find our own hearts becoming overflowed with the same arrogance and self-righteousness and ugly that we spend so much time trying to condemn right now and we find ourselves just recirculating the same violence and hate but convincing ourselves it's something morally superior because it's coming from us. But if we want to be a people, and I'm saying this to myself and to all of us, if we want to be a people that can advocate for actual justice and confront systems of oppression and raise the bar on how we treat all people and present a compelling case by our lives that love actually does when it begins with paying attention to and learning to be honest with our own hearts. Confronting the reality of what's in there, giving ourselves permission to feel all the different things that we're actually feeling, 
and perhaps even change how we think about things in the process. And then creating similar space and grace for others to do the same. And to be clear, oftentimes people aren't gonna change. You and I can't control that. We can't control what other people do or don't do, but we can control ourselves. And so we just keep coming back to the heart of the story that Jesus invites us to live out together, to love others the way we want to be loved. So friends, it's been a hard week and it's been a revealing week. But let's keep guarding our hearts and living out a good story together. Love you all. Thank you for joining us today and welcome home. If you are in need of assistance during this crisis, please reach out at crosspoint.org help.